This is Mike. It is March 13th, 2020, Friday the 13th, and uh, we got a good one here today. Um, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to start with coronavirus, which is, you know, it's a big deal right now. And um, we're just going to go down some really strange paths. So uh, <laughs> hold on, this, hold on, I'll do my best to um, tie it all together. So I want to begin with... Um, with the Joe Rogan experience. Uh, I'm familiar with the podcast. Like I know it's like one of the biggest podcasts which is out there. And I've seen parts of it um, before, but I've never actually listened to it. Um, but it's certainly been on my, my radar. Anytime that there is, um, anytime there is something which has a great deal of influence on the consciousness of a large amount of people, you know, that I pay attention to it. So, right now, the, the big story is the coronavirus. And, um, you know, my personal opinion is, you know, I'm waiting and seeing. If, if you've been in this game long enough, you've probably gone down a lot of paths where, you know, you, something was sold or you thought was going to be the, the, uh, uh, the, the event. And it turns out not to be. So, I mean... Um, whether that's Comet Ison or whether that's SARS or anything like that, you know, once you've been down that, or 2012, once you've been down that a couple of times, uh, you get to become a little bit suspicious. And um, I follow the work of John Rappaport, um, who does a really, really good job at explaining um, how stories like this can be crafted and created and are... Um, and he knows a lot about about the um, the issues within the medical industry, and so he can break it down um, very very well. And I recommend uh, as you consume whatever information, you take uh, lots of different perspectives. And I think he offers a great perspective. But anyway, um, you know that's my thought on this. And. But I did know that this is different, you know, whether or not it's just being like sold differently or um, or if truly it is different um, in terms of like it's it's um, it's effect on on human life. You know, we'll, we'll wait and see. But it's different just in the fact that, you know, they're they're really quarantining places and there's like, you know, there's this is the population is responding um is responding in a more um, obvious way and in a stronger way than they have in the past. So that in itself, you know, it's different. You know, you, you know that, and we'll wait and see to, to what degree. But what I found was interesting was two people, two friends of mine, um, uh, relatively normal, you know, no, normal thinkers, uh, um, mainstream in their thought, but, but, with a, a healthy degree of suspect, but I don't think, near, you know, my opinion, not nearly enough, uh, uh, suspect of what comes from, from mainstream news sources. But uh, two of my friends uh, whose, uh, whose, whose um, opinions I am interested in and I respect, uh, they both made reference to a recent Joe Rogan podcast where he had an expert on um, the coronavirus. And I did not anticipate uh, either one of, of, of these two people to respond the way they did. So I was like, all right, let me go check and see what this thing's about. So that's where we're going to begin this. Um, what's the guy's name? Michael Osterholm. And March 10th was when, when uh, this podcast was released. And um, so I guess a little bit about this Ulster home guy. Uh, I mean, I saw, I watched, I watched, um, I watched, uh, um, let's see if that's a little bit better. Yeah, there we go. Um, I watched probably about 25 minutes of the interview before I couldn't watch anymore. And I mean, my initial thoughts was this guy's straight out of central casting. You know, he's he's playing the role he's supposed to play. And, and you know, in my opinion, Joe Rogan's doing what Joe Rogan's supposed to do. Whether or not these guys realize, um, you know, whether they're in on it, I don't know. You know, whether they're just um, doing what they naturally do well and are um, being played by um, 
you know, one level up. You know, I don't know. But what's certain is this Alstraholm is an insider, you know. Uh, two really strong indications is one, he's a member of the Council of Foreign Relations. And, you know, you don't get into that without being, um, without demonstrating your, uh, your um, proficiency in your area of work or of focus, and then also probably that um, your beliefs are very much in line with with the beliefs of uh, Council on Foreign Relations. So it doesn't necessarily mean that every single member who is in the Council on Foreign Relations is, you know, a Rockefeller insider, but um, they're certainly uh, being used to propagate those type of um, uh, agendas. Maybe I'll take a step back. Um, the way which I understand it is uh, how agendas are propagated is there's a hierarchy. There's a hierarchy of these different um, these different groups. And as you go higher up in that hierarchy, the the greater the status is, and um, the less less familiar these groups would be. And so probably like towards the top, but not nearly the highest would be like, you know, your Council on Foreign Relations, your Bilderberger Group, um, your Trilateral Commission, all of those sort of things. And then like levels up from that would be um, like the Club of Rome, uh, probably a whole bunch of other groups that, you know, maybe not even have names. But it's uh, these organizations that kind of like, you know, ideas are seminated down um, and then members of these different groups are leaders within other groups and then within whatever their their industry of choice is and this is how information is um is is passed down particularly agenda and, um you know if if you go back and and you read a lot of the literature that comes from these groups from that perspective and you you listen to the words of of their founders you know it's 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 pretty clear so this guy, um, Osterholm, he's definitely an insider. He's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, probably was invited to become a member. You know, that's that would be a huge honor uh, from a mainstream perspective. So of like, yeah, of course, you're going to jump at it. Why would you not? Um, it also says that he has been the recipient of six major research awards from the National Institutes of Health and, and the, the Center of Disease Control. And... Um, you know, I, I don't know what six, I don't know what major research awards are, but, you know, my guess is like, you know, it's broken down into categories and major is probably like a lot of money. And, you know, that's kind of the name of the game. And so you could see like he's, 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 he's part of it. Um, and when he talks, like, you know, you just kind of, uh, you, it's, he, he's, he's charming. He tells some funny stories. Uh, he may have been drunk. I thought he was slurring his speech. You know, maybe, maybe that's just how he speaks. But um, so he's, and he's, he speaks with a great degree of authority. And there's a, there's a real kind of, um, uh, you know, he's very sure of himself. He's very sure of himself. And there are a couple of things which he said, which just immediately, like, you know, my, my red flags, um, went up and so probably the first thing this is probably like the the um the the least offensive i would suppose is like you know he's he's talking about um he's talking about the coronavirus and and just like how everyone should be terrified i mean he was going down this list and if you're going to listen to him and you're going to take that like completely that this guy knows better than what anyone else knows that um he's completely right you know you're going to be scared you're going to freak out this guy's like he's sounding really sure of himself but keep in mind everyone everyone from the uh uh the world health organization or the center of disease control that spoke about sars that spoke about some of these other like you know um, pandemics which we've been conditioned for for you know decades from movies um, you know, they sounded really like experts also. So, I mean, time will tell if, uh, if this actually turns out to be the, 
this debt as deadly as they they say it is or is it just the hype and and the hype is just feeding itself right now i mean it's it's you got to see i mean unfortunately people dying on your streets like you got to when you begin to see that it's different than anything else you've ever seen well then yeah you know it's true it's real but if you're just getting your information from the internet there's always the chance that like you know none of it's real but anyway, so going back, so the first thing he says, he's, he's talking about how serious this is, and he, he at, at 19 minutes, 38 seconds, he says, I've got a, you know, he, I've got a lot of experience in this area, and he goes down this long list of all of his credentials about why he, all of this work he's done, and then he goes, and I tell you, there is no evidence whatsoever that this is a bioweapon. Um, says a little bit later, he says, I don't believe there's any evidence, but, but what he's saying is he's, he's resting on his laurels as an expert. You know, this is under the logical fallacious, um, uh, understanding of, 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 of navigating, um, fallacies and, 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 uh, contradictions within, um, arguments, you know, this is the classic appeal to authority. You know, this guy's like, you know, you should listen to me just because I'm an expert. Because at no point does he explain why, you know, what one would look for, for evidence of a bioweapon. But, you know, may, uh, I'm guilty of that too. You know, sometimes when I talk about things which I'm very well versed and someone who doesn't really know as much, you know, who hasn't spent as much time researching as I have, you know, I, <laughs> I've, I've fallen to the appeal of, of to, uh, to authority on a topic too so i mean it is very possible that you know that's just what has happened but that was the first red flag that um that went up for me and then where is it right here he makes reference in the interview he talks about how he had a book which came out um he said in the interview september 11th 2000 but it says here on amazon september 12th so i don't know if it's a slight exaggeration or you know to to make it more of a a compelling story but um this doesn't exactly add up but regardless he is tying in to the collective consciousness he's tying into their um into their their mind into the listener subconscious he is tying in you know uh 9 11 to his area of expertise and then you know all the all the things that happen when when you you anchor you connect different ideas so he's tying it into 9 11 and this is where i i'm ultimately going to go to is is um is at minute 20 uh at the 20th minute, 45 seconds, he's talking about, about the virus and he's talking about how, um, you know, just what, it's this perfect storm of viruses. And he says, we couldn't have crafted a virus like this. That is, um, that is doing what it is doing. We do not have the creative imagination or skill sets. And so two things. One is I don't buy that for a friggin' second. They don't have the creative imagination or skill sets. I mean, that's the entire nature of a lot of these these groups that he's a part that he is a part of, these these World Health Organization groups. If you read his bio, all of these different kind of like medical pandemic think tanks. Their entire um and he also says in 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 the his interview, he begins his 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 um, professional life within um, within bioweapons by interviewing Soviet bioweapon scientists in the early 90s. Like the entire nature of what he does is to go and come up with scenarios of what would be the world's greatest uh, uh, created virus. And what he described on this virus really isn't that like crazy. It's not like, oh, this virus comes and then your head doubles in size and, and raccoons grow out of your ears. You know, that would be something which say like, we could have never predicted that. No, this is, this is like, you know, this, of course they predicted this. That's insulting to say that they have not, pre that he could not imagine that. So, I mean, like that in itself, like everyone should be like, seriously, I don't believe a word you're saying. But then where where the 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 marker of of where he's indicating what what this is linked to he's like we did not have the creative imagination and so that is a very important um marker in our culture in terms of that phrase 
And so <clears throat> to give an example, like right now, so social distancing, like that's a word that or a phrase that just came out of nowhere. Like, oh, we got to do social distancing. It's a, it's a euphemism for quarantine. But I mean, maybe that's been around for a while and now it's like just being introduced and it's new to me. But regardless, like this is like new to most people, this 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 phrase. And it, it was never like explained. It was just used and everyone knew what it was. Kind of like, I don't know, like five years ago, they started talking about this thing called the polar vortex. There's never a polar vortex before, but they just throw it out there. And so this phrase, uh, you know, or this idea of like not having the creative imagination, this comes back to 9-11. Remember, he already linked in to his story, you know, with his book. He, he says like, oh, you know, my book came out one year before 9-11, then 9-11 hit and became a bestseller. Um, so he's linking in that he's 9-11 oriented. He's counsel in foreign relations. He's like, you know, he's, he's, he's in the same circle. So I don't buy it for a second. That's just, just me. That's my opinion. But uh, this is going to go to some crazy places. But uh, just one more. So I want to tie this into where this is 9-11. So it begins with the 9-11 tie-in. Um, there was a quote by National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice, and she said um, on May 16th, it was like, I don't think anyone could have predicted that that they would try to use an airplane as a missile, a hijacked airplane as a missile. That's what she said in the press conference. And that's Again, that's as ridiculous as him saying, like, I can't imagine that they, um, that they, uh, uh, um, couldn't imagine a virus that's doing what this virus is doing. That's ridiculous. I mean, there's a, there's a famous, um, like, uh, FBI internal document showing like the Twin Towers with planes crashing into it like you know from the early 90s uh, It's been the plot of movies that 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 hijackers would use planes as um, as as missiles and and Apparently that's what happened when the crash of uh, the int intentional crash of Egypt Air Flight 990, which happened at the very end of 1999. I mean, that's a ridiculous statement. And then the the uh, um, the conclusion of the um, the official Blue Ribbon Council to get to the bottom of of what happened on 9/11 was they 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 blamed it again on this failures of imagination and so this word failures of imagination or phrase failures of imagination kind of came into the collective space you know right here this was uh um i don't know this was i think like a guy from um graham i think he was a member of he may have been the chair of the uh the the 9 11 um committee and here it says it's um where is it mistakes missed opportunities bureau bureaucratic incompetence and neglect lack of imagination you know it's this lack of imagination like, oh we never could have thought about this thomas Keane uh, and his fellow panelists cited the failure of imagination this lack of imagination you know, and it all comes back to the statement of condoleezza rice and it sounds just like this guy so i mean that's why when 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 I see that, you know, that's initially what pops in my mind. And so it's like, yeah, you know, it's, of course, you know, it makes sense. He's on the biggest podcast and, you know, we'll wait and see what happens because undoubtedly something is happening. Um, and that's where we're going to get into the second part of this, this, um, this analysis. And this is going to be, this is going to be the strange stuff. This is going to be the weird stuff. So, um, I want to preface this with my own um, my own take on reality, which is like I don't know. I only know what for certain what I can see with my own eyes, um, what I've experienced with my own with my own skin. But even that, I can take with a degree of um, suspect. So I'm I'm I, I've got a I'm 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 uh, very suspect on a lot of things. I'm open to everything, but I'm also suspect of everything. And so I don't know what's going on. I'm interested. I'm interested in what's going on, but I don't know. And so one of the one of the um, uh, 
uh, areas which I don't know if it's factual. I don't know if it's it's just like CIA bullshit. I don't know if if it's um, if the CIA bullshit is the truth. You know, I don't I don't know, but it captures my attention, and that's um, the realm of timelines, timelines, um, alternative realities, uh, uh, um, time travel. And it's not so much like I'm a fan of it. It's not like, oh, this is really interesting. This is so cool. It's more so like I just got like this feeling that there's something there to that. Um, my sense is always like, you know, how it's presented to us may not be exactly how it is. But, you know, that's a place to begin to think, research and so forth. And undoubtedly, the events of 9-11-2001 changed the trajectory of the planet. And if there's such a thing as like alternative timelines and stuff like that, undoubtedly 9-11 is one of these places where like, you know, something happened. Maybe 2012 is another one of these things. Um, but undoubtedly 20, or September 11th is one of those events. One of those time timeline changing, traje trajectory changing events. And now... At least I'm seeing this, this correlation, this connection between the events of 9-11 and now what's becoming the coronavirus. So again, this is March 13th. Uh, right now, like nothing too major is happening in the United States. I think I just heard like an hour or so ago, the governor of Pennsylvania, the state I am, I live in, uh, issued like all schools are closed for two weeks. You know, I, from my perspective, we're, we're looking at a slippery slope, you know, what's going to happen. I'll tell you, you know, there's even a possibility that there's this, this push for this, 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 this social distancing. And, you know, maybe that's because everything that needs to happen is happening right now. It has to do with people coming together. I don't know. I don't know. But, but hear me out. Cause this is going to get strange. Um, so this appears to be, uh, you know, at least in theory, another one of these um, timeline type events. It's being tied to one of those. And right now it looks like it has the potential to be something like that. And whether a timeline event is like, you know, timeline changes or if like now is an opportunity for timelines, I don't know. But I'm just open with some ideas. So let's go and let's look at, um, let's go and look at Joe Rogan. Because Joe Rogan is, he's worthy, he's worthy of, um, of a deeper look just by the fact that his show is so immensely influential and popular. And when something like that happens, when you have like a show or, or anything that really gets into the consciousness of a lot of people, and I'm going to suggest podcasting is probably one of the most influential forms of media because it's very personal. You're probably listening to it in your car. You're probably listening to it headphones. And it feels much more personal than just watching TV. Um, and this guy's like, you know, he's very, very influential. And even more so, like, this guy's got an interesting dynamic. Um, uh, the, his the group which would fit into his his audience is very kind of specialized probably in like tastes and in age and interests and so forth so okay we're gonna go look at joe rogan and you know as i said top podcast his full name is joseph james uh rogan and uh point out this right now we're going to come to this later so he went to newton south high school all right so <clears throat> i remember joe rogan from um the early 90s so i'm 48 years old i was in my 20s in the early 90s and i remember the tv show news radio i can't really remember any episodes i've got like flat flashes of memory of like what I think the set looked like but I, I, I have a very clear memory that I liked it and uh you know side note um that would be the clue for me is like you know is that a real memory or not you know I just have a memory of a memory but you know I have a lot of memories that way I don't know what that means I'd, I'm curious how other people remember 
But anyway, so news radio. Um, that's really what introduced Joe Rogan to the collective consciousness. We could see that um, before that he had a, a developmental deal with Disney, which I don't think turned out to be anything. And he did some other small shows, but it was news radio, which really was his introduction point. And I always find like, you know, introduction points are, are um, significant. Uh, when looking at particular at a star, at someone who has a great deal of influence and is promoted by um, the system, whether that is um, you know mainstream promotion or, or you know more like grassroots promotion, which is what what this is positioned as. You know, who knows? Maybe it is. But um, so. The first can be either like the very first, the, the first thing they did, or maybe it was the first thing that was their breakout hit. It doesn't matter. Like you go and you look at it. This is an art form beginning to understand, you know, to be able to, to really um, un deconstruct, deconstruct the narratives of the, of the, um, of the hypnosis. You know, that's what this is. So, okay. So news radio uh, ran for four years and um it was an ensemble cast kind of comedy and another reason why i want to talk about that is is you know the whole premise of news radio was it's talk radio it wasn't you know it was news radio and if you think about a podcast it's basically what a podcast is so we have this sort of like connection between like you know the irony of 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 Joe Rogan beginning in this like kind of or getting a start um, really at least making a name the first real name he made for himself as on the show called um, news radio and then when he really became um, you know an international an international name like beyond like I think he was the host of some like uh, like reality TV show and he was obviously a star from that but like his 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 reach has gone much much further now um it was this news radio podcast if you will so that in itself is kind of interesting 